Hello everyone. So, uh, hello everyone. I am Amit Kapila, working in Enterprise DB. I work for PostgreSQL features uh, and Enterprise DB uh, products features. So uh, today I am here along with Robert to present on Zheap. Okay, yeah, most of this talk is actually emits, but uh, I'm going to just do a, a couple of slides of introduction and then a couple more slides toward the end. Um, so uh, today, here's our agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about why Zheap and the purpose of undo. Uh, we'll talk about Zheap itself, and then we'll talk about a, a couple of specific things related to Zheap, uh, the TPD for extended transaction data, undo, indexing, uh, Amit's going to show a little bit of performance data, and we'll talk a little bit about pros and cons of this new thing that we're trying to create. So um, the thing that we're really concerned about here is bloat. Our reason for wanting to develop Zheap is to have less bloat, or to be a little bit more precise, uh, to have bloat that's not so difficult to get rid of. Um, so what do I mean by bloat? Uh, those of you who have some experience with PostgreSQL probably have a pretty good feeling for this already. Bloat occurs when the table and the indexes grow, even though the amount of real data being stored has not increased. Um, so there's extra stuff in there, but it's not doing us any good. Um, bloat is mainly caused by updates, because when we update a row, uh, we have to keep both the old and the new versions of the row for some period of time. Um, and there are a couple of problems with bloat. W one of the concerns is that it will use more disk space if your database is bloated. But actually, these days, that's typically not a big deal. You probably have plenty of disk space. Um, but what you don't have is plenty of time. If your table is twice as big as it needs to be, regardless of whether it fits in memory or whether it has to go out to the disk, if it's twice as big, it takes twice as long to scan. If it's 20% bigger, it takes 20% longer to scan. If it's 100 times bigger, it takes 100 times longer to scan, and that'd probably be really bad. Um, this problem of bloat is something that is sort of intrinsic to MVCC. Uh, when you have multi-version concurrency control, that means there are multiple versions. And different systems make different trade-offs in terms of where those versions get stored. PostgreSQL and Firebird put all of the row versions in the table. Oracle and MySQL put the old row versions in the undo log. Uh, SQL Server has something called tempdb that is used to store old row versions. Um, and the key point that I want to make here is our decision to leave the old row versions in the table makes it harder to get rid of them, because the old row versions are mixed with the current row versions. There's no clear separation between the two. So uh, it's, it's hard to take you know, half the data when the, the data that you want and the data that you don't want anymore are, are mixed very closely together. Uh, and, and the last point I want to make about bloat is improving vacuum helps contain bloat, uh, but it can't prevent it completely. Vacuum is like a recovery mechanism. You get some bloat into your table, and then you vacuum a lot to try to make sure that no more gets in. But you still have some. So if you want to have no bloat you, you, or less bloat, uh, you, you need some other technique. Uh, so that brings me to my, la my last slide here, which is uh, on our sort of three high-level goals that we're trying to accomplish with Zheap. Uh, which, since I haven't defined it yet, is the new table access method that we're trying to create for PostgreSQL. Um, so the first is better, better bloat control, and uh, we really have two ways we want to accomplish that. One of them is being able to do updates in place. Instead of creating a new row version in the table, update the row version that's already there right where it is. Um, and the second is to be able to reuse space very, very quickly after a transaction commits or aborts and some row versions are no longer needed. Uh, we don't want to have to have a vacuum that has to intervene in the middle in order for the space to be reused. Second high-level goal is to do fewer writes. Uh, we want to eliminate hint bits, freezing, and anything else that could dirty a page other than a data modification. So if you insert a row or update a row or delete a row, then it's legit to dirty the page. 
But if you do anything else, we would very much like to not dirty the page so as to minimize the amount of writing that we have to do. Um, and uh, we also think that we can get closer to this goal if we can uh, provide a feature called delete marking, which I'll talk about briefly a little bit later. Um, that will reduce index bloat, which will reduce writes. Uh, and finally, we want to make the on disk format a little bit smaller in size. We want to make the tuple headers narrower uh, by not storing the transaction information in the page as much as we can and by also squeezing out some of the alignment padding that's present in the, in the current format. So those are our goals, and now I'm going to turn it over to Amit, who is the development lead for the project, and he's going to talk about uh, how we make it happen. So uh, Robert has told here, like our high-level goals for the Z-Heap. Now I will uh, talk uh, the, uh, some, some details about the Z-Heap, like uh, the basic designs of the top-level modules, Z-Heap itself, undo, TPD, and indexing. So in the Z-Heap, uh, like the first thing we uh, have changed is the page format of the Z-Heap. Now, in the page, we have a new entity called uh, transaction slots. And the, all the transaction information is stored in the slots instead of the tuple. So the, uh, the transaction slots contain transaction ID, epoch, and the latest undo record pointer of that transaction. I'll come later to uh, the part of uh, explaining what the undo record pointer is. As of now, the number of slots in the page are configurable, and by default, the value is 4. Each transaction slot occupies 16 bytes. And we also allow the transaction slots to be reused after the transaction becomes too old, which means older than the oldest tax ID having undo, or when it is committed or rolled back. This allows us to uh, operate without having too many transaction slots. So th this is what uh, I was talking about, like uh, the page structure will be something like this, that the transaction slots will be present in the special space of the page, and then the tuples will grow from the bottom, and the item pointers will grow from the top. So that part is same as, uh, as of our current heap. But this new special space has been uh, taken in the page. So the transaction information has been removed from the tuples, and it has been uh, taken in the uh, transaction slots. One thing to notice here is the last transaction slot, which we are mentioning as TPD entry location. As we have fixed number of transaction slots on a page, it could easily happen that more uh, transaction when more transaction wants to operate on a page, uh, we need more slots. So we need, need an extended data structure, which we are referring as TPD. And the last slot here is used to refer to that location. So next is the uh, tuple format. Here, if you can see that. Uh, on the left side, we have a heap tuple format, and on the right side, we have a Z heap tuple format. So, the uh, most important thing to notice here is that we have uh, Z uh, heap tuple has transaction information xmin, xmax, cid, and then ctid. This, which consumes 18 bytes of information. So, all this information uh, is removed, and uh, now. Uh, we have just some flags over there in the uh, tuple header. So this transaction information has been moved to the transaction slot or to the undo. And uh, the new thing is that uh, we refer to the transaction slots via this tuple header. If you can see the first info mask 2, it contains the number of address and the transaction slot ID, which means that it will tell us the transaction slot to which this tuple points. So if we overall see that we are reducing the 
size of the tuple and increasing uh, somewhat the size of the page. But as the number of tuples will always be more in the page, we will win. And I will show you something like uh, based on the performance and the size we have uh, done for uh, comparison we have done for heap and zheap towards the end of the presentation. So the another entity uh, which is uh, tightly integrated with zheap is the undo. So as of now I am just explaining you the top level idea of what is the purpose of undo. Undo is uh, responsible for reversing the effects of aborted transactions. So whenever transaction performs an operation, it also writes it to the write ahead log, which we call as redo, and records the information needed to reverse in, in undo. So if the transaction aborts, undo is used to reverse the transaction, and redo is used for the crash recovery or streaming replication. Undo is all. Uh, we also store the old versions in the undo for the purpose of MVCC. So independent of avoiding bloat, having undo provides systematic framework for cleaning. So for example, if a transaction creates a table and the post after that the PostgreSQL or the system operating system crashes, the files could be leaked. Now the, ha by having undo we can fix this because it can reverse the effects. This is just one example. It's not that our project is trying to deal that at this stage. The last point. So uh, in this new heap, we need to emit an undo, undo record for each of the insert, delete, and update operations. For, for an insert, we will insert the uh, new write and emit undo which will remove it. For, for deletes, we will emit an undo which will put back the row. So inserts and deletes are uh, somewhat simpler operations. Update is a, a somewhat tricky operation where updates could be performed in uh, broadly two ways. First is an in-place uh, update in which the old row can be maintained in undo and the new row can be maintained in heap. So this method is better because uh, if we are able to perform all the in-place updates in the system, there will never be any bloat or uh, ever be any bloat created. But there are some cases where we can't uh, avoid that. For example, when the new row is bigger, and such that it can't fit in the same page as the old row. In such cases, we have to perform the non-in-place update. So, and the second case is when index column is updated. We could handle the second case by uh, providing the delete marking, but as of now, for uh, those that also uh, non-in-place update has happened. So, as you can see, uh, the first strategy is preferable, like having in-place updates, but we really can't avoid non-in-place update in some of the cases. So I think uh, even if we have non-in-place updates or deletes, the space in the Z heap could be claimed very fast. Like we can uh, claim the space for deletes, non-in-place updates, and up updates that update to a smaller value as soon as that operation is committed. Not like our current heap where uh, we need to wait till uh, it becomes all visible. So this is the an, another uh, crux part which Robert has also covered in the initial goals that we can immediately recover the space even if uh, there is some bloat uh, created. The another important consideration is that during scans, we need to make a copy of the uh, tuple instead of just holding the pin as we currently do for uh, heap because uh, in the Z heap, we have in place updates which can actually uh, change the tuple. So, next I will uh, talk about undo chains and visibility.
if anybody has any question till now. Uh, sorry, uh, eval plan qual. Yeah, eval plan qual is actually uh, implemented. Uh, so the question is that for the non-in-place updates, uh, does it create a complexity for the eval plan, eval plan qual mechanism other than uh, what our current heap has? Actually, there is it, the eval plan qual is slightly implemented differently, but the basic idea or the algorithm remains same as in heap. So the way non-play in place updates had uh, get handled in he it is almost handled similarly. And you say that uh, every time a column that is indexed is updated, you have to do the delete and insert fix. As of now, yes. But we have a plan. Uh, we will cover in the later slides that we want to make uh, turn it into in place updates by providing delete marking. Right, that is what the last slot points to. We have, but in the page, you have to have fixed number of slots. Pa pa how the page size can grow? Page size is limited. No, no, but if you have so, three space on the page. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the, in the page also, we could keep, make it uh, extendable, but uh, as of now, we have e extended it towards the outer side. Like, if we have fixed slots and if we require, we get it. So, so one consideration is, if you increase the slice of the slot array, and then you don't come back to the page, all of the slots in, in that page are just sitting there forever, taking up space. Or if you clean them up. Well, right, but then you're back to needing to vacuum pages routinely, and that kind of sucks. Need, need so like, I think there are going to be cases where it's better to overflow to a TPD page, and then recycle the TPD page when we don't need it anymore, rather than letting the slot array grow very big. I think you're also right that if we only have four slots and the page is getting hammered, well, why not just grow to eight slots or, or, or whatever? We don't have code for that, but, but yeah, I, don't I think see why it can't be done. Maybe there are. I have thought of it, but uh, there, like right now, we have two pointers, like lower and upper. We can grow only two things. Maybe if we have to grow three things uh, flexibly. We need somewhat more uh, page structure change. But I think uh, well, that that could be done. Just move the data around, right? Probably have to log a full page. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so uh, the next is uh, about the undo chains and uh, visibility of uh, stuff, how this works in Zheap. No, the, uh, first I will briefly cover the undo chains. Like, the undo chain is formed at the page level for each transaction. Basically, each undo record header contains the location of the previous undo record of the transaction on the same page, if any. I will show you in the next slide uh, via diagram how the chains are formed. But other than that, when, whenever the current tuple is not visible, we just traverse the undo chain to find the visible tuple, if any, for the snapshot. So this is how uh, the undo chains are formed. So basically, let's assume that uh, the first operation happened on the zheap page one, and that operation is insert operation. These all operations are uh, performed by the single transaction T1, just to explain you. So it will create an undo record uh, for the insert operation. The second operation happened on the same page by the same transaction which is an update operation, the new, row, the new value has been reflected on the page, and the old value has been moved to the undo record. You can see that ABC has been uh, moved there. And the point to see here is that we have a back chain, like uh, in the same transaction on the same page, we uh, keep the pointer uh, for the previous uh, record which this transaction has put into the undo. Now, in the same transaction, say page two has been modified and the row has been updated. So uh, again, same, like 
the previous contents of the row has been put in undo and the front uh, row has changed. But you can see there is no back pointer or nothing is there. And after that again in the last operation we have again updated the previous row in the same transaction. So the previous contents def have been moved to undo record and uh, the chain has been formed like uh, from def you can see the previous operation on this page is linked in the undo. So this is uh, what I, I mean to say that how the undo records are changed. This will help us in uh, quickly constructing the visible uh, version during visibility checks. By the, on the same transaction. Right. So this change after transaction per row. No, no, not per row. Just in the example, it is shown as row, but it is per transaction. So even if some other row would have updated, the same phenomena would have happened on the same page. Yes, exactly. So one transaction would have a separate chain for every page they touch? So, no, the, see, the undo records are laid linearly. Like for each transaction, the undo records will be together. If you see, all the undo records are together for the whole transaction, even if different pages are there in the serial order. But we have formed the chain on the page basis so that it could be immediately uh, visible versions could be constructed uh, relatively fast. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm talking about the, yeah, per page per transaction th thing. Because it, it, even if. The, in the transaction, it will, uh, like, the slot will always point to just the latest uh, undo record of that transaction. But uh, from that undo record, you can reach to the previous undo record, which has been written to the undo by the same transaction in the, for the same page. Does that also hold if a non-in-place update pushes, pushes a couple onto a different page? Yeah, in, in that case, we will write two different undo records. Then actually, the if let's say these are four different transactions, then you would see that first uh, all will be in different uh, logs. Or not, if, they uh, if they happen one after one, it will be in the same log, but this back pointers won't be there. I think he's asking how do you, how do you find the right tuple? The, the chain is per page and per transaction. Per ZD page. Yeah, per ZD, per ZD page and per transaction. So if one transaction multiplies, uh, modifies uh, multiple tuples on the same page, then you might need to go back several entries in the chain in order to, to find, find the old tuple version of some particular tuple. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. So it, so it gets bad if you have a transaction. So then you can have multiple tuples on the same ZT page. So yeah. Sharing the same slot. Yes. 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 So that's what we have shown in the tuple format, that each tuple will have the transaction slot ID. Like it will just point to the uh, transaction slot. So if one transaction comes into a page and starts updating tuples on the page, a same page over and over and over and over and over again, you can accumulate a very, very long chain, right? right? And you have to follow the chain even if, if all of those updates were to a different tuple than what you're actually looking at. That, well, right, yeah. but you do know which tuples are relevant to that chain because the tuples have a pointer to which transaction slot is, is relevant to right. that tuple. In the worst case, you update one tuple on the page a million times and another tuple only once. And and then it's yeah, right. You have to. Yeah, now it's up. Okay. 
Yeah. I think we can discuss more uh, towards the end. Uh, we are running short of time. So uh, now this comes to the next entity uh, like TPD. Basically TPD is nothing but a, a temporary data page consists of extended transaction slots from the heap pages. Why we need uh, this uh, TPD stuff? In the heap page as I have shown in the first slide we have only fixed number of transaction slots and even if we keep it variable, it could uh, still be uh, like, it can't be uh, too many. So for the cases where we have to uh, say, uh, operate, uh, uh, take many locks on the same page, share or key share locks. So we need uh, many transaction slots or even, uh, or for the cases where we have fixed transaction slots, it could also lead to the deadlock. For example, somebody holding the slot on uh, page two and then coming to page one and the transactions could conflict and lead to deadlock. So these are the primarily two reasons where we need uh, some extended array of transaction slots which can flow down to some bigger number. The TPD overflow pages will be stored in Zheap itself interleaved with regular pages. We have a meta page in Zheap from which all the overflow pages are tracked. And the idea of putting this uh, TPD in heap was from Andres Frund, who is my colleague. Uh, the original idea was from Robert to have this TPD as a separate entity, but during discussions we found that it will, we can handle it in heap itself. Yes, it is clear, well, that is gone. So th the, all the transactions will be in uh, this transaction slots. I, I will explain you how these transaction slots are laid in this TPD page. So uh, the uh, meta page as of now is a very simple page which is uh, used to track the uh, overflow pages. We have kept the first used TPD page and the last T use TPD page as an entry and all the other TPD pages are linked via a list like uh, doubly link, uh, behave as doubly linked list. So we always first try to uh, use the last TPD uh, page which we assume, uh, which, which has some space. The page, is that like an index or is it yeah, like yeah. Zero? yeah, it is a zero first page in the heap. So this is a, a TPD page. So here uh, we have a special space uh, for linking it with the other pages and otherwise it will be somewhat similar to the heap page, not exactly, that the TPD entries uh, grow from the bottom and we have a page header uh, to track it. So what exactly is this TPD entry? It is basically an extension of the transaction slots array in the heap page. <laughs> Tuple headers normally point to the transaction slot responsible for the last modification, but since there are not enough bits available to handle this, uh, uh, we have an offset to transaction slot mapping in the TPD itself. So uh, the uh, various alternatives for uh, undo storage uh, which we have uh, thought of our uh, single, ch I, I won't go in details because Thomas has uh, covered in his unconference session and we are uh, falling short of time here. 
So uh, we have three different alternatives which we have thought of single shared file, uh, single file per transaction and single file per backend. And we could see that uh, with the single file per backend approach, there is multiple advantages like the space waste, wastage is uh, less and the cleanup uh, for the uh, committed transactions could be uh, done in an efficient way. So next comes to the undo record and the undo page format. There is nothing very uh, fancy about these things. The, uh, in the undo page format, we have a normal undo page header which stores an LSN and uh, the other uh, bits similar to our uh, normal page. And the undo records are laid out one by one. The only special uh, thing which we want to highlight here is that you can see that there are a lot of optional information in the undo record which makes us, uh, uh, which makes uh, the undo record flexible, which means that if really the uh, record has to be big, like in case of update, then the undo record will be big. Otherwise, the size of undo record will be smaller. For example, when only uh, there is an optional transaction header, which will be written only when it is a first undo record for a transaction, something like this. So this optional uh, uh, idea was Robert, I think, and he has only designed it. It's not my fault. <laughs> so uh, next is the wall considerations for undo data. One important consideration is that we don't need to have full page images for data in undo logs, except when data checksums are enabled. As the undo logs are always written serially, so there shouldn't be a torn page issue. Like, we don't need to rely on the existing state of page to perform operation in the undo logs. And undo logs doesn't have compaction or uh, moving uh, data operations, which can change its uh, positions of the undo records. So again, the rollbacks is uh, uh, in Zheap are different. Like, uh, for rollback, rollback to save point or errors, we need to apply all the undo actions. The only special consideration is for the error cases where we can't rely on the existing transaction. So we start a new transaction to perform the rollback actions. So another important point, we have always heard that rollbacks could be very lengthy. So we have uh, some alternative for it to make it cheaper for the backends is that when the undo uh, size of uh, undo grows too big for a transaction. We push it to the undo worker and the backend can just return. So undo worker will perform the actual rollback actions for the transaction. And this uh, threshold is configurable. So to apply the undo actions, do you really need to have a transaction open at all? It seems like this is non-transactional. So all this heap, uh, we have to perform, uh, redo the heap operations on the heap. I think it is dependent on the number of undo records and the uh, total operations happened on it. For example, uh, like for the insert rollback, it is very difficult. Uh, it is very easy to apply. For the update, you need to completely write the row. So I think it de all depends on the size of undo and the operations. OK. I think uh, the next thing is uh, undo retention. Like undo data needs to be retained till all the active versions uh, need to see old versions. For example, for all the transactions which are in progress, for aborted transactions till the time undo actions have been performed, for committed transactions till they are all visible. We could reduce the time period for which undo needs to be retained for the uh, in the last category for committed transactions by implementing something like snapshot to old. 
a feature uh, famous from uh, database starts with O. <laughs> We consider uh, undo for a transaction to be discardable once its XID is smaller than the oldest X min. So I'll quickly go through that uh, how the undo worker works. Basically, it discards all, all the old segments, and if uh, and it basically recycles the segments. So if there are uh, multiple segments. Uh, of undo which could be discarded, we just recycle it. Each segment of undo is, as of now, 1 MB, based on some tests Thomas has done. Uh, he has configured it to 1 MB. So once the uh, discard and insert location meets, we can completely discard the undo. But if it, like in this case, as I have explained, if it is not the case, we just recycle the segments. So th those will be reused after the current active segment is finished. So the basic uh, job of discarding the undo logs is performed by undo worker. It possesses all the undo logs, identify the aborted transaction and perform their rollback, process the request of other backends, and most importantly, it forget all the buffers corresponding to discard did undo to avoid I.O. So basically, if there is no long-running transactions, the undo pages will never even touch the disk. So next, I'll hand over to Robert to explain the indexing in Rehib. So can you hear that? Yeah. OK. So um, Amit got to explain the code that actually exists. I get to explain the code that doesn't exist yet. Um, the, the Zheap code as we have it today, as Amit has it today, uh, and his team, uh, works without any changes to the index access methods, um, which is good, because that means you can have indexes on a Zheap table, which is nice. Um, and we plan to keep it that way. We plan to continue supporting the use of unmodified index access methods with Zheap. But uh, we believe that there are some big advantages to updating those index access methods to support what we call delete marking. Because it would allow us to perform in-place updates when index columns are modified. And uh, many people are probably familiar with uh, the behavior of hot updates uh, in the present system. If you add an index uh, to a column that you update a lot, suddenly all of your hot updates turn into not hot updates, and you get a big performance drop. So we'd like to do better in Zheap and have this delete marking system, which we're hopeful will enable us to keep the benefits of in-place updates even when the index columns are being modified. So the idea is that when we perform an in-place update uh, that changes the value of an indexed column, we go find the old index entry and mark it as being possibly deleted. And of course, we also have to insert a new index entry pointing to the tuple. The columns where the, the indexes where the corresponding columns haven't been modified, uh, we don't need to touch those indexes at all. So if you think about it, what ends up happening is uh, in the current system, when we have an index column that's modified, we do a non hot update, we touch every index once. Every index incurs one insert. In this system, the indexes where something has changed get touched twice, once to insert the new entry, once to delete mark the old entry. And the indexes where nothing has changed don't get touched at all. So if you have 10 indexes and you only modify one of the indexed columns, you should come out ahead because you're doing two index touches instead of 10. Um, and you're avoiding creating bloat that you'll have to try to get rid of later. So here's the end game that we're hoping for. We'd like to get to a point where we don't need to vacuum. So how practical is that? Um, well, we definitely need all of the indexes on the table to support delete marking to have any chance of th having this work. Because if they don't, 
then they just continue to accumulate index entries forever and they'd bloat without bound. So that would be terrible. Um, the Z heap pages themselves are mostly okay. They don't need to be hinted. They don't need to be frozen. Um, we don't need to write them again, assuming the transactions that modified them commit. Um, and if there's any leftover garbage in the page that needs to be cleaned up, that's kind of okay, because we can just prune the page the next time somebody's actually making a, a data modification. Uh, but there is a problem. Uh, there are some problems. Um, even if we've delete marked the index tuples, they're not actually gone. So you might say, well, we're still going to need to vacuum the indexes uh, in order to actually remove those tuples once the, the updating transactions or deleting transactions have committed. Um, but we think we can mostly work around that problem um, by uh, expunging the delete mark tuples from the page either the next time the pages are scanned or maybe also when they're evicted from shared buffers. Yes, Andres? Well, there's a little code left to be written here. <laughs> there are a few problems to be solved. Um, but, uh, but we think it might, we, we, we'd really like to come up with a solution. Um, uh, because, uh, you know, if we, could, if we could do these things, right, if we could uh, get rid of, uh, we already have a system in the current heap that the next time you scan a page that has index entries that are dead, you blow them away. So that optimization should certainly be possible. As you point out, there are some problems with trying to do it when we kick things out of shared buffers, but it would be really valuable because in most cases, that would mean we dirty the, the index page by delete marking it, and then before actually writing it out, we would dirty it a second time uh, to remove the index entry, and then we'd be done, and the space in that page would be free. Uh, but you can certainly construct cases where none of this works, and you accumulate extra index entries. But it would basically be you'd have some index pages that were never being accessed and were never being loaded into shared buffers, but were still taking up disk space. It's not as bad as for the heap, because for the heap, even portions of the data that are invisible still get accessed from time to time. But for index pages, a portion of the tree that never gets traversed, in some sense, doesn't matter as much, because you're never reading those pages at all. Another problem that we have to solve is that we have to make sure we don't lose free space. Because one of, the things that, one of the things that vacuum does is it goes through the table and finds all of the space that's been freed up in all of the pages and puts that into the free space map so that we can recycle it. If we don't vacuum, then when we perform the foreground operations, we have to make sure that we don't ever lose track of any free space, because otherwise we will bloat. Bloating is a bad characteristic of a system whose purpose in life is to not bloat. Um, even if we do all of this stuff, even if vacuum uh, becomes somewhat optional, some people will probably still want to do it as a kind of more aggressive cleanup. Uh, but we believe we can see a path to sort of getting to a point where this becomes sort of optional optimization that might help your performance a little. You could do it if you want to, rather than something where it's like vacuum frequently enough or die. <laughs> It sure does. And the traditional problem we have with that is that you Tom doesn't like it. The, well, yeah. <laughs> the reason he doesn't like that is that what if you have an expression index and you have a broken function there and it just blah, 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 and you can't refund the index isn't broken. Yeah, and, and that's definitely a concern. But also, what if you had a workload that you couldn't run on Postgres because you got so much bloat everywhere that it was terminally slow and you had to switch database systems so completely? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're gonna ha you're going you're gonna to end up with a corrupt index. I mean, in, any system that's based on refinding the index entries has that potential pitfall. Um, yeah, if you have a function based index on your broken function, don't you have by definition have a corrupt index? Well, the current system is more able to recover from those kinds of situations than this would be. This is going to be very sensitive so to in that. This case, you would potentially get nasty error of like, you know, could not read block one, two, three. I, I don't see why you'd get those results, but maybe we can take that offline because we're short on time here. Just uh, let me finish it. Okay. Uh, so 
Sorry? Yes, we're imagining the delete mark as a single bit. That, that's correct, yeah. And there's some other concerns about making sure that index entries that we insert don't become visible too early, which we have a different idea how to solve, and I'd love to tell you about that and so would admit, but there's just not time in this presentation. So, okay, the last thing uh, I would like to cover is that uh, some performance data which we have took with our prototype code. So this is basically size and TPS comparison of heap and Z heap. We have used PG Bench uh, to perform the simple updates which contain, uh, which comprises of one update, one select, and one insert. So this is the uh, test at 1,000 scale factor on an Intel uh, x86-64-bit machine with two sockets. And the non-default parameters are a shared buffers 32 GB and all such tuning we have done. So. Uh, this is the data of one of the tables uh, for the size comparison, which is accounts table. This is the table which gets updated in the transaction which we have performed in PG Bench. So here you can see that the initial size of accounts table in heap is 13 GB and in Z heap it is uh, 11 GB. So this is all due to that reduction in the tuple header size. The size in heap grows to 19 GB at 8 client count and to 26 GB at 64 client count test. Whereas in Z heap, it stays at 11 GB for both the client counts at the end of the test. So basically the test configuration is uh, to generate the bloat, like where one transaction has been kept open for 13 min 30 minutes and then uh, it got committed while the test is running. So we have seen that the undo uh, data gets discarded immediately within 3-4 seconds after the open transaction is committed, but the bloat in heap doesn't go away, even after many minutes. And uh, at the end of the test, we have seen that TPS of Z heap on this machine and this configuration is 40% higher than heap at 8 client count tests. In uh, some other high-end machines, we have uh, seen speeds improvements up to 100%. So this is uh, not the actual uh, things which we might see because right now we have not done any optimization. This is just based on our initial design and code, whatever has been written. And of course, I'm sure it can go either way when the final code is uh, committed to PostgreSQL. So this is just based on our prototype code. So. I think most of the benefits and drawbacks I have uh, covered, this is just a summarization of the whole presentation. Basically performing updates in place wherever possible prevents the bloat from being created. Old tuple versions are removed eagerly from the heap. Most things that cause a page to be rewritten are eliminated. Because Z heap is smaller on disk size, we get a small performance boost. In workloads where the heap bloats, and Zheap doesn't, we get a massive performance boost. Yeah, so there, these are all a lot of benefits which, for which Zheap has been designed. But there are few drawbacks as well, like reading a page will be more expensive when there are transactions operating on a page for the reasons known, like we have to traverse the undo chain. Delete marking will have some overhead, but we will still win if there are many index on table and only few of them got updated. Transaction aborts could be lengthy. So yeah, in nutshell, this is all about Zheap. I think we could take many, many hours to explain all the details, but we have tried to come up with some information within the time. So this is the team uh, which is working on Zheap. I am leading the development team of it, and uh, Dilip Kumar, Kuntal, Mithun, Ashuto Sharma, Rafia, Bina, and Amit Kandekar is supporting me. And Thomas Munro is responsible for storage of undo logs. Neha Sharma is uh, helping us in testing uh, this project. And uh, Robert Haas is the original uh, design author of this whole engine. And I, I would like to also thank Mark, our uh, VP, uh, senior VP, who has uh, provided the support for so long time for doing us this project.
Yeah, that's it.